From the University of Arizona Distance Learning Program, this is Optical Sciences 505, Diffraction and Interferometry, with Dr. James Wyant. This broadcast is authorized by the Arizona Board of Regents on behalf of the University of Arizona. Any reproduction or retransmission of this course or use of same for granting of credit without the express written consent of the University of Arizona is strictly prohibited. Well, I'll say good morning to everyone. Certainly is a, uh, a nice day here in Tucson. As, as I was walking over here, I was wondering about Bill up in Boise and uh, what kind of weather he has up there today. But Bill, I'll let you know it's beautiful here in Tucson. Well, let's start out by looking at the uh, names for the teaching assistants. And these are the two people who will be grading the, the homework. And the first one is Kit Lou. And um, maybe if we could just zoom in there a little bit. And her office hours will be Wednesday and Friday from 1 until 2. And her office is in room 615. And her phone number here is 621-4727. I need to call her and the, uh, I won't read the email address here. Uh, the second uh, teaching assistant we have is uh, uh, Tim Gleason. And his office hours will be Monday and Wednesday from 9 to 11. And he's also in room 615. And uh, he actually had the nerve to uh, give out his home phone number, uh, 318-1146. And I think he said he would accept calls uh, up to 2 a.m. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that's what he said, but uh, something like that. And uh, he also uh, has an email address, as you can see here. OK, last class, we were talking about combining uh, two sine waves. And remember, at the end of the class, we said that uh, if, we, if we could zoom, OK, if we have two sine waves, um, one of amplitude A, cosine of X plus phase alpha. And the second one, let's say, just is uh, cosine X. If we combine these two sine waves, we get the resultant is also a sine wave, but uh, of some uh, different amplitude and some different phase. And just as a reminder, we said right at the end of class, when we went through and, and calculated the amplitude and phase for these two sine waves, let me, let me just write down the result that we got. And then we're going to go on and look at the combination of many sine waves. So what we remember right at the end of the class, what we had here was that for the phase of the resultant sine wave, tangent phi naught, I guess we were using, uh, we found that that was equal to amplitude 1 times the phase, the sine of the phase of, of the first sine wave plus amplitude 2 times the sine of the phase of the second sine wave. And then in the basement here, we had A1 cosine phi 1 plus A2 cosine phi 2. So that was the resultant phase for these two, uh, when we added together these two sine waves. And the amplitude, or actually the amplitude squared, right at the end of class, we had the A naught squared was the amplitude of 1 squared plus the amplitude of the second squared uh, plus the interesting interference term here, 2A1, A2, cosine phi 2 minus phi 1. And so the resultant amplitude is, um, um, or maybe we, we'd call this the intensity or irradiance, can be greater than sum of the irradiance of the two, or uh, it may be less than the sum depending upon the phase difference between the two. So anyway, that was combining just two sine waves. And now uh, what we want to do today, this morning, is to combine several sine waves. And this will take us to um, section 3.5.1.2. So 3.5.1.2. And it's just called combination of several sine waves. OK, so let's say we have E of um, x and t is equal to well, summation 
little n equal 1 to some capital N of a sub n, e to the i phi sub n, e to the i kx minus omega t. So all these sine waves have the same frequency, but they're going to be, have a different amplitude and a different uh, phase. And so just like we did last class when we were looking at two sine waves, we could write that as an a naught e to the i phi naught um, e to the i kx minus omega t. And so what our goal is now is to find the a naught and then find the phi naught. So what we will do here is we well, we just write down again that a naught e to the i phi naught is a summation of a sub n e to the i phi sub n. And um, uh, just in the same way we did before, we could expand this and we know that the real parts are equal. We know the imaginary parts are equal. And remember last time when we found the phase for the combination of two sine waves and we just took the imaginary parts and divided that by the real parts. And we'll do the same here. So tangent phi naught is equal to summation n1 to capital N, a sub n sine phi sub n. And then we'll divide that by the the real parts of a sub n cosine phi sub n. So that's our phase. I mean, it was very simple to calculate, uh, very similar to what we had before when we just had two. Now, to calculate the amplitude is going to be a little more work, but it's not going to be too hard here. So what we will have is that. Um, We'll go back here and um, solve for this a naught. And so we're going to say that we're going to square it. a naught squared is equal to, well, we're going to get double summation here, 1 over n, and the other we'll say is m. And so it'd be a sub n e to the i phi sub n. And then um, uh, a sub m e, well, we're going to take the, this is a naught squared, so I have to take complex conjugate here, minus i phi sub m. Okay, so that gives us a naught squared. Now that, we want to play with that a little bit to get it in a, a form that uh, is more like what we, what we normally see. And so the first thing we do is we're going to pick out the term where n is equal to m. And so that would be the summation of a sub n squared. And then we have whatever's left. So that's uh, sum over n, sum over m. Uh, but now we picked out where m was equal to n. So I have to write down here m is not equal to n. And then we would have an a sub n, a sub m, e to the i, um, phi sub n minus phi sub m. Okay, now move that up to the top here. And um, so what we can do here, we can re just rewrite the first term in little n, uh, summing over little n of a sub n squared. And um, what I'm going to do here, well, we'll write down the double summation, n and m. And then we're going to say that m is less than n. And so I have an a sub n 
a sub m e to the i phi sub n minus phi sub m. And then I have to pick up the other terms because we just summed over here m is less than n. So I can add in an e to minus i. Um, I'm run out of space here. Phi sub n minus phi sub m. So that picked up the rest of the terms. And so we can go down here and just rewrite that in the form that we normally see. And that's why I use the whole width here. So that's equal to um, summation n a sub n squared plus summation now n and m. And again, m is less than n. And we'll take these here. And when we combine them, what we're going to get is a cosine. So we'll get 2 a sub n, a sub m, cosine phi sub n minus phi sub m. And so that's a naught squared. And uh, I like that equation well enough, I'll, I'll draw a box around it. Okay, so it's, you know, it's similar to what we got when we combined only two beams. We get the summation of all the amplitude squareds, and then we get this interference term, which will go as a product of the two amplitudes, cosine of the phase difference, and then we have to add all these up. And um, if we think here for a second about this, let's look at, um, let n be large. And um, for the first example here, let phi be random. And so now what we would have with a sub naught squared is equal to summation a sub n squared. And if we have a bunch of these guys and the phi's are random, then this second term is going to tend to cancel out. And so the interference term will go away. And as we go through this course and talk about interference, this will be the case where we have incoherent light. That the interference term will just drop out and we're simply getting the sum of the uh, a sub n squares. And uh, just for the heck of it, let's say if um, all the a sub n are equal, then a naught squared is just going to be what capital N times a sub n squared. Okay? And this is what we will call the incoherent case. Okay? So then the next thing, you know, we looked at the incoherent case, so you can guess that probably the next thing we're going to do is to, to look at the coherent case. So let's go on and do that. Leave that right up there. And uh, I'm also going to make it in phase coherent case. And so now we have a, I'll just go back to a naught squared is um, what's a double summation of a sub n a sub m. And so um, all these guys are in phase. So we could write that as um, summation of a sub n, a sub n um, squared. And what we're really interested in here is all a sub n are equal. And what we're going to get then is that a naught squared is equal to n squared, a sub n squared. And so in the 
incoherent case, we got a naught squared was n times a sub n squared. In the coherent case, where everything is in phase anyway, we got a naught squared is equal to n squared times a sub n squared. So, you know, you, you would, maybe you would think that um, there's a little problem with conservation of energy here. You've got more here than here. But as we go through the course, we'll see that if we add up the um, energy overall space, that uh, these two cases uh, integrated overall space will be the same. It's just that um, the, the distribution of energy in space will be different for the coherent and incoherent case. Anyway, I think that's kind of kind of interesting. And I also brought a couple of little pictures to show you. And I, there was a handout for those of you who uh, came in late. There's a handout in the back of the room that you can get after class. Or you can take this off the website if you like the colors. Um, this little plot here, we showed before when we added two waves. What we're going to do here is to add three waves and um, of same frequency different phases and different amplitudes. So we have this uh, blue guy here, A cosine of x plus alpha, and we have a different shade of blue over here, cosine of x, and a, a green up here, B cosine of x plus beta. And we add these three guys together, and what we get is, again, a sine wave, as we've shown, with some different amplitude and a different phase. OK, works pretty well. Now, in this drawing, I show that the amplitude is greater than the individual amplitudes. And just to make sure that no one thought that that was always the case, I've included one more printout here, where we've, again, added three cosines. This one, cosine x, and this one here, and this one over here. And the resultant is the red here. But the point I'm trying to make is that when you add these up, the resultant may be smaller than any of the waves that you're adding up. In fact, uh, uh, I guess you could easily pick this so that the resultant actually had zero amplitude here. OK, so any questions on just adding of uh, n sine waves and you know, same frequency? And you know, the end result is that we get another sine wave of same frequency with different amplitude and different phase. And, and you're all experts now in calculating the amplitude and phase of this resultant. OK, well, have a little more of my medicine here for a second. OK, well, that's, that's interesting. Um, but let's now go to something else. It's also interesting here. And now, again, we're going to add some sine waves. Uh, and we're going to pick just two sine waves to make life simple. Uh, but they're no longer going to be the same frequency. We're going to add sine waves of different frequencies. And um, so this is 3.5.2. And we're going to call these beats. And so they're a different frequency. Um, and to make life simple, uh, we're going to make them the same amplitude. So one of these guys will write E1 of x and t is A1 cosine of k1x minus omega 1t plus phi 1. And the second guy here, E2 of x and t, um, same amplitude, so A1, cosine, uh, different frequency, K2x minus omega 2t, and a different phase, phi 2. And so we'll just add these two, and uh, uh, so E is A1 uh, cosine K1x minus omega 1 t plus phi 1 plus cosine k2 x minus omega 2 t plus phi 2. Okay, well, I mean, that's 
the answer, but uh, it's not in a form that we can really understand it, uh, too well. So let's play with the algebra just a little bit here. And um, there's one trig identity that we're going to need to use here, which goes as cosine alpha plus cosine beta is two cosine um, well, one half alpha plus beta uh, times cosine one half uh, alpha minus beta. So we add the two cosines, and we get a product here of a cosine of half the sum times cosine of half the difference. And so we can just plug that in up here and um, see what we get. And so E is uh, A1, 2 cosine 1 half. Um, yeah, it becomes a little, a little messy here, but we'll write it down. K1 plus K2 times X minus omega 1 plus omega 2 times T plus phi 1 plus phi 2. So that's the sum. And then we have to multiply that times the difference here. So cosine 1 half K1 minus K2 times X minus omega 1 minus omega 2 times T plus phi 1 minus phi 2. Okay. Well, I mean, that looks worse than ever, I guess. But uh, have faith. We'll just do a little more work and it's going to look beautiful. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do, try to clean up this mess, is that we're going to write down some, just define some things. So we can rewrite this in a form that looks a little bit nicer. I swear I see more in my monitor here than you see in your large monitor. Okay. Um, let's say let omega average be one half omega one plus omega two. Okay, and k average be one half oops, of k one plus k two, and then we're going to have something that I'm going to call omega sub m, and later we'll see that m maybe modulation is a good thing for that, but it's called omega sub m. That's one half omega one minus omega two. And k sub m is 1 half k1 minus k2. And then I guess the other thing we've got to do is alpha is 1 half phi1 plus phi2. And beta is 1 half phi1 minus phi2. OK, so we define these three things, uh, the omegas, well, the averages, omegas and k's, the sub m's or modulations, omega sub m, k sub m, and then the alpha and beta having to do with phases. So now we would just take these guys and plug it into up here. And without too much work, we get the result that E is 2A1 cosine K average X minus omega average T plus alpha. Okay, I guess that follows pretty, pretty easily from here. Times cosine K sub M X minus omega sub m t plus beta. Okay. That's kind of interesting. In fact, I'll even draw a box around it. Get some color here. Okay. 
Now, normally, when we're looking at these beats, normally the two frequencies would be about the same. So let's say if omega 1 is approximately equal to omega 2, then the average frequency is going to be much, much greater than the this difference frequency. And then the second term is going to change much more slowly than the first term. So maybe I should write that down. And then second term changes much more slowly than first term. Okay, that's kind of interesting. We'll, we'll see a plot of that in a minute. But before we do the plot, I want to uh, just take this and square it for the heck of it. So don't forget this. I'm just going to square it now. So what we'd have is an e squared. Four, a one squared, cosine squared, k average x minus omega average t plus alpha times cosine squared, k sub m x. Oops. Uh, minus omega sub m t plus beta. So I might say, so what? Well, let's play with that just a little bit here. And I'll just rewrite the first term down here. Um, now let me leave the 4 off for a second here. We get an a1 squared, cosine squared, k average x minus omega average t plus alpha. And then what we can do with a cosine squared, we can expand that to get a 1 half times 1 plus cosine of twice the angle. So I'll get a 1 half, so this 4 here is going to become a 2. And here I'm going to get a 1 plus cosine 2 um, k sub m x minus omega sub m t plus beta. can read that, minus omega sub mt plus beta. And uh, so we just got 1 plus twice the angle. So I mean, this is like the just the individual sine waves oscillating, because they're about the same frequency. And um, then this is some modulation term superimposed on this. And we said that if the two omegas are about the same, then this omega sub m is, um, or k sub m, are uh, small. And so this is a lower frequency modulation superimposed on this. And before we look at a picture of this, let me just write down one more thing here. k sub m here um, was 1 half uh, k1 minus k2, just the way we defined it. And um, uh, let the period of the modulation um, let that equal to, I'm just going to call it a lambda EQ. Okay? And so what we would have here is that. Um, to go through one period here, we have a 2 there, remember that, uh, 2 times k sub m. And so we would have, uh, just writing down k sub m, 2 times k sub m, we'd have 2 pi times 1 over lambda 1 minus 1 over lambda 2 times the period, lambda sub eq, 
So that will go through one, one cycle, or this will equal to 2 pi. So we go through one period. And so we would have here that 1 over lambda q, 1 over lambda eq, the period, is equal to 1 over lambda 1 minus 1 over lambda 2, or if you like, lambda eq is equal to lambda 1 lambda 2 over lambda 2 minus lambda 1. And let me just take the absolute value because I'm not sure which one is larger, lambda 1 or lambda 2. So we get this basic high frequency, a modulation on top of that. The period of the modulation goes as the product of the two wavelengths divided by the difference in the wavelengths. And so as the two frequencies or the two wavelengths become nearly the same, this becomes a large number. The period becomes very large. Now we'll see this equation like this many times this semester. Um, sometimes there might be a two or something in here. But whenever you're, you're combining two beams of um, uh, two wavelengths, lambda 1 and lambda 2, you end up with this beat that has a period that goes as a product of the wavelengths divided by the difference of the wavelengths. So you'll, you'll have many opportunities to see that during this, this uh, semester. Well, let's just plot some of these things. Uh, again, these are in the handouts that you receive today. Or those of you out in TV land, you'll soon receive them, or you can take them off the website. And so, First handout, we just have these two sine waves, the blue one and the green one, k1x minus omega1t plus phi1 and cosine of k2x minus omega2t plus phi2. And um, when we add these two, uh, we get something that looks like this. So we get some amplitudes here, high amplitudes, and then we're going to get something where the amplitude becomes very small here. And so this is just the, the sum of the two here. And so we get something like the individual frequencies. And then this modulation here is multi multiplied times that. Now, put that off to the side here and bring up another little plot. And this is just showing the same thing, but where I have uh, also drawn in this solid line showing the modulation and showing that the period here, as we said, goes as the product of the wavelengths divided by the difference. Now, if we look here, this thing is oscillating, and the average value here is always 0. And so in order to see these beats or hear these beats if we're listening to sound, um, we have to be able to resolve the individual frequencies as well. Uh, uh, so we have to be able to resolve the high frequency in order to see the beats when we simply add the two sine waves. Any questions on this? Okay, so you're all experts on beats now. I have one more view graph here that I don't go through any derivations here, but I'll, I'll show this view graph. It's kind of interesting. Now, repeat here what I said before. You know, the average value of all this is zero. So in order to see the beats, we have to see the high frequency stuff. We have to resolve that. And this was where we were adding. We were simply adding the two, you know, adding the two sine waves. If we did something a little bit different, which is to multiply the two sine waves. And I'm not going to go through the algebra here for you. But if we multiply the two sine waves, what we would get would be something that um, also has a beat. But it turns out that if you multiply the two, and the interested student, I'm sure, will go through this to show it, that you don't have to resolve the individual frequencies in order to see the beat. So it's a little different between multiplication and addition. So when we 
you know, in this course, we're mostly adding, doing interference diffraction. Uh, when we multiply things like moray patterns, um, is where we uh, would we'll multiply the two instead of adding the two. Okay, so so much for beats, I guess. Here we go on here, and next thing will be standing waves. So I, I wonder, I, before we uh, turn the TV cameras on, we talked a little bit about basketball. And as you'll find out as we go through this course, I, I, uh, while I love interference and diffraction, I also love basketball. Okay. And I'm wondering um, how many of our uh, t people out there in TV land uh, watch basketball. And I'm really wondering how many of you saw the game um, last Sunday on TV. And uh, I forgot to tell you it was a homework assignment, uh, a little late, but in uh, any case. Any of you out there watching us on TV, if you watch the game or if you want to lie or something, just send me an email and tell me how much you enjoyed, the, enjoyed that game. Unfortunately, we don't have anyone taking this from New Mexico, I don't believe. No, that's too bad. Okay, okay let's go on here. 3.5.3. Standing waves. Okay, what we're going to do now is that we're going to take two sine waves. We're going to pick two sine waves with the same frequency, um, same amplitude, different phase, but they're going to go in opposite directions. And we're going to see what we get. So E of X and T. is um, A1 cosine Kx uh, minus omega t plus phi 1. And um, the second one here, well, I'll write it down here, plus A2 cosine, well, I won't make it A2. Let's make it A1, make life simple, so these both have the same amplitude. A1 cosine Kx plus omega t plus phi 2. So one of these is minus, one is plus, so they go in opposite directions. So just two waves traveling in opposite direction. Same frequency. Okay. Well, we want to play with this to get it in a form that uh, tells us a little bit more. And to do that, there's a trig identity that we need. And that trig identity goes as a cosine of A plus or minus B is cosine A cosine B minus or plus sine A sine B. And so we could write here that the cosine of A minus B plus the cosine a plus B is, well, what the sines will cancel out, and we have two cosine A, cosine B. Okay. So all we have to do now is to play up here and get this in the forms of the proper A's and B's. We have a nice answer. So what we'll do is we'll say, well, let Now, phi 1 be equal to phi 1 plus phi 2 over 2 minus phi 2 minus phi 1 over 2. Nothing very exotic about that, I guess. And 
and we can say let phi 2 equal um, phi 1 plus phi 2 over 2 plus phi 2 minus phi 1 over 2. That works out okay. And then we can write, I guess I'll say, therefore, A here could be equal to Kx plus phi 2 plus phi 1 over 2, and B is omega t plus phi 2 minus phi 1 over 2. And so we could write here the E of x and t going back up to this nest right here. The E of x and t is 2a1 cosine kx plus uh, phi 2 plus phi 1 over 2 cosine omega t plus phi 2 minus phi 1 over 2. And that's really it. So what we have here is a product of two cosines. And this guy here depends on x. So it's x dependent. And this one is time dependent. So what we get now, if I were to plot that, what we would get would be, so here we've, we've just added the two cosines. And so we end up with something. So these two cosines are going in opposite directions. We end up with something here, the cosine of kx plus some phase, times the cosine of omega t. So at each point here, this is going to be oscillating up and down. And the amplitude of the oscillation, so it oscillates up and down with time. And the amplitude of the oscillation here uh, depends upon x. And in some locations, the cosine of this is going to be 0. And these will be what we call the nodes of the standing wave. And we look at how far does, uh, how much does x change by for this to go from 1, 0 to the next 0? Well, this kx would change by pi. And um, so k is 2 pi over lambda. So x would change by half a wavelength. So we have these nodes here separated by half a wavelength. And as we study interference, we will we'll see that the closest together we can get zeros in the interference pattern will be half a wavelength. And that will be when the waves, as we said here, are going in exactly the opposite direction. And we'll get these nodes separated by half of whatever the wavelength is. So that's standing waves. So any, any questions? George? Um, I could have done it either way. The, one of these is the, the k term and the omega term will have the same sign. You go the opposite direction, they'll have the opposite sign. And it doesn't matter which one you change. I changed the, the t one. Okay. So we looked at, in superposition here, we looked at the combination of two sine waves. Um, we looked at the combination of several sine waves. And we said that the resultant was always another sine wave. We looked at um, um, combining uh, 
two sine waves of different frequencies. And we found out that we got a, 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 a term that was going to depend upon the, the uh, uh, different frequencies. And we got the beats, we call them. And we looked at the combination of two sine waves going in opposite direction, and we got these so-called standing waves. So that was everything I was going to cover on linear superposition, unless you had some questions. We'll come back to this. I mean, this is really the, the basis, uh, the basic material upon which we're going to uh, derive all of uh, interference and then uh, second part of the course, diffraction. So it's pretty, pretty important that we understand uh, all of this material. And you have some homework problems, you'll get a chance to, to uh, test your understanding. And again, I'll say that if you look in the homework, homework sets that I've handed out, there are a lot of problems, many more than what you're asked to do for the course. But I'm assuming that the interested student will work additional problems, of course, right? Because the best way to learn this material, I think, is to actually work, uh, work homework problems. Okay, so that takes us through chapter, or section 3.5. Section 3.6 is on polarization. Now, if you look, or for these core courses, Optical Sciences has a, uh, a list of topics that have to be covered in the core course. And if you look at the list of topics for Optics 505, you'll see that polarization is not included. But I've kind of learned the last few years that as we do prelims like that, the students are often weak in the area of polarization. So I'm adding a little section here on polarization. I'm not going to cover a whole lot, but a few things. And uh, there's a, a fairly good chapter in Heck's book on polarization that I, I recommend that you look at. We're really going to look at three things here in our section on polarization. We'll first look at the various states of polarization and define the different states. Then we'll spend a very short time looking at retarders. And then we'll go on and talk about a mathematical description of polarization where we use Jones calculus and where we use Stokes parameters and, and Mueller matrices. So polarization, um, thing to remember here is that the electric field is a vector quantity. And so when we work with the electric field, we have both the magnitude and the phase to worry about. Uh, magnitude, and, excuse me, not magnitude. Magnitude and direction is what I meant to say, to look at. And the direction of this is what, the E field is what we call the polarization. So as we go through here, we're going to find that there are various states of polarization. And um, so let's just list them first, and then we'll look at uh, how we describe, mathematically, how we describe them. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a hint that there are five that we're looking for. Maybe some of you can, can help me. Can you list some of the states of polarization? Linear, good. And another one? Circular, good. And a third one? Elliptical. Now it's getting tougher. What's the next one? What? Random, right. I'll call that unpolarized. Or random, if you like. E. Give me a chance to take a sip of coffee. I mean, yes. a sip of medicine. Thank you. Well, this is, uh, I put an E just to give you trouble. Uh, partial, we'll say. So it's not completely polarized. It's not completely unpolarized. It's partially polarized. OK? <coughs> So these are the, the five states. And um, 
So we have to look at some way of describing these five states. And um, um, let's say let k be along the z-axis. And then we could write that e sub x vector um, of x, y, z, and time t is some amplitude a sub x um, cosine kz minus omega t and a unit vector in the in the x direction. And we could write down here that e sub y of x, y, z, t is some amplitude a sub y cosine kz minus omega t. Now we have to put in some phase phi. And that's a unit vector in the, in the y direction. And then the last guy here, um, e sub z x y z t and we're going along the z axis so we'll set that equal to zero now when we talk about the states of polarization all that's going to depend upon will be the phase difference phi and the relative amplitudes a sub x and a sub y so let's just write that down state of polarization depends on relative phase difference phi and relative sizes of a sub x and a sub y. Okay, so that's all we have to determine. Um, phase difference relative sizes of amplitudes, and we know everything there is to know about the polarization. Okay, so um, 3.6.1.1, unpolarized light. We'll tackle that one first. Um, well, as one of you said it's just this random. The instantaneous polarization will vary in a, in a random manner. Instantaneous polarization varies in random manner. And that's all we're going to say about it. 3.6.1.2. Instantaneous? Yeah, I guess I can see why you might wonder what that word is. After a semester of my handwriting, you'll have no trouble reading. OK. Um, Second one, let's talk about plane polarized light. So plane or linear polarized light. Well, in this case, phi will be equal to 0, or phi, the phase difference between the two components, is equal to plus or minus pi. <coughs> And so what we would have here is that um, one case would be that E is A sub x in the x direction plus A sub y in the y direction cosine kz minus omega t. So this is a case where phi is equal to 0. 
And this right here is a fixed amplitude. And if we were to make a little plot, the entire of black, let's go to blue. Okay. So X, Y. I don't know, the polarization is. This oscillates back and forth here, and uh, you know this has some amplitude of a sub y, and this has an amplitude of a sub x, and uh, this makes some angle theta, let's say, with respect to the x-axis. So this oscillates back and forth here. Um, linear polarization. And I guess, so that was where phi was equal to 0. And maybe I should write down here what happens if phi is equal to plus or minus pi. Very similar thing. E is um, a sub x i minus a sub y j, because we're going to have phi is equal to plus or minus pi, cosine kz minus omega t, phi was plus or minus pi. So again, this is some fixed amplitude, just like before. And if we were to plot this, I don't know, it would look, you know, something like this, let's say. And um, this being a sub y, and this being a sub x. So it's very, very similar, just rotated. Okay. And um, Maybe while we're on linear polarization, I might say something about um, an analyzer. So, so an analyzer is some device that is going to transmit light polarized in some given direction. So let's say with um, um, uh, transmission. in the x direction. And so if we take this analyzer, kind of ideal one, we'll transmit everything with a polarization in the x direction. We'll transmit nothing from the y direction. So if we illuminate this analyzer with um, um, light linear polarization at some angle theta with respect to the x-axis. The um, transmitted field electric field will be equal to what? If this thing has an amplitude of E1, and what we'll get here is the component E1 cosine theta. And um, transmitted irradiance will be equal to whatever the initial irradiance is times what the cosine squared of theta. And uh, whose law is this? Do you remember the name of this? Now, give me a chance to get some more 
Yes. Okay. Malice. M A L U S. Law. Which probably means that Malice was not the guy who thought of it, but got credit for it. Okay. If we had, let's say we have unpolarized light falling on this analyzer. And the radiance of the unpolarized light is I. How much of that's going to get through the perfect analyzer? One half. One half, right. So half of that would go through if we had unpolarized light. Okay. So you're all experts on linear polarization. Not quite yet. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay. Tell me when you're ready to go on. We want to go on to circular polarization. Again, I think you know there are a lot of lot of good books on on polarized light, and um, you've spent your eighty-five dollars for uh, hex book. Do students get a discount? Yes. 10%, yeah, okay. So you spent a little less than $85. Of course, you had tax then. Spent $80 or something in hex books. So anyway, look in there. This covers this uh, pretty well, I think. Okay, circular polarization. So this will be, yeah, go back into the blue. 3.6. Point 0.1.3. Circularly polarized light. So now what we would have is that a sub x is equal to a sub y. And we're going to have the phase difference between the two beams between the two polarizations, the phase difference is plus or minus. Any of you know from previous? Pi over two. Right, pi over two, plus or minus 90 degrees. And so we could write here, you know, E sub x, it's A sub x cosine kz minus omega t. And that E sub y, well, still a sub x cosine kz minus omega t plus or minus pi over 2. And so we could rewrite that as minus or plus a sub x sine kz minus omega t. And so what this is minus when we have plus pi, and it's plus when we have, I mean, plus pi over 2, and it's plus when we have minus pi over 2. And so these two, x and y components, are 90 degrees out of phase here. So if we think about that for a second here, let's just, well, let's draw a picture first. And um, so this is a sub x cosine kz minus omega t. And this guy up here is minus or plus a sub x sine kz minus omega t. And so when one of these is a maximum, this is going to be zero. Okay. And so if we kind of think about this as time goes along here, this is going to be rotating around. Max, zero here. When it becomes a max here, be zero in this direction. As time goes around, this is going to rotate. And since these guys have the same amplitude, it's going to rotate in a circle here. So, saying that, or writing it down here, 
that we have an e squared, e sub x squared plus e sub y squared is a sub x squared. So as it rotates, as we said before, the amplitude is a, is a constant. So this is a constant with time. And the direction that this rotates, whether it goes around in a clockwise direction or if it goes around in a counterclockwise direction, uh, depends upon the sign of this phase here, whether the phase is plus pi over 2 or minus pi over 2. And um, so if phi is equal to minus pi over 2, <coughs> we will call this, in this course anyway, and this, I have to warn you, this varies a little bit from book to book, but we'll call that right-handed circular. And so we think about this, it's going to go clockwise, the vector will go clockwise in time when uh, viewed head on. Okay. And if pi, phi is plus pi over 2, this would be left-handed. And so it would go counterclockwise in time when you hit on. And as I said, some, I think this is the more common way of saying right-handed and left-handed. But you can find some books. I think Klein's one that defines it the opposite way. And uh, the difference is that we talked about uh, kz minus omega t. And if you go to some books like Klein's, they talk about cosine of omega t minus kz. And that gives you the switch in the right-handed and left-handed. Um, complex notation, we just kind of rewrite this here. Um, unit vector in the x direction of uh, e sub x e to the i kz minus omega t plus unit vector in the y direction well still same amplitude e sub x e to the i kz minus omega t plus or minus pi over 2 so we could rewrite that if we wanted to. It's e sub x, e to the i, kz minus omega t, and an i, in vector next direction, plus or minus, depending on plus pi over 2 or minus pi over 2. Um, well, i, square root of minus 1. Maybe you should write it this way. This is unit vector in the x direction. This is square root of minus 1, i, unit vector in the y direction. So kind of a compact way of writing it. And so um, we can think of, you know, Circular polarization as being two linear polarizations that are 90 degrees out of phase. But we could also think here, if we have linear polarized light, I could think of that as adding together two circular polarizations, one right-handed and one left-handed. Okay. So maybe I should write that down. Turns out to be useful to think sometimes of this. A, um, linear polarization uh, 
um, can uh, be thought of as uh, two opposite circularly polarized beams. So left-handed and right-handed. Of equal amplitude. Okay. So add together a left-handed and a right-handed circular equal amplitude and you get a linear. Yes, I have a picture here. And I didn't give you a handout on this because you paid eighty dollars for this picture. And you didn't go to your, to the Hex book and get it. Figure eight point two, eight point three, eight point four, and eight point five. I guess that we show here. I don't know how well we can see this on the TV, but this is just a, a linear polarization propagating along. And then we over here, we have a right circular polarization propagating along here with time. And so with, not with time, but with distance here, I should say. And if we do this with distance, we, this is right circular. This is rotating in the counterclockwise direction going with distance. If we take this right circular and go with time, so this is a plot of time here, now it's going to rotate in the clockwise direction. So that's another reason why right and left hand are a little confusing. With time, a right circular goes clockwise. With distance, the right circular goes counterclockwise. And uh, anyway, I think this is uh, when you look at this in your, in your book, you'll see it's pretty, pretty clear now. Well, we're about out of time here. Uh, what we're going to do next class is <coughs> we'll come back here and still talk about polarization, but we're going to talk about elliptical polarization. Then we'll go on ahead and talk about um, retarders a little bit. And then we'll talk about Jones calculus and Mueller matrices. So it's kind of a fun. Uh, a fun set of materials that we'll have uh, next class. Any questions before we break? Okay, so I'll see you bright and early Thursday morning. This is last week's handout.